Coming from my universe, the Munich Security Conference, when I'm on stage looking at the participants, I'm looking at uh, a bunch of people, average age, 60 plus, and all male. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited about the partnership which we've been able to create between uh, the Munich Security Conference and uh, DLD. We, of course, in the context of the Munich Security Conference, we've been debating for the last 50 years missiles, tanks, airplanes, the application of military force, and the prevention of conflict. Um, more recently, we have found out that it's not only about defending our borders in the classic sense of military and diplomatic security, but that it's actually also about defending our institutions, defending democracy, and this is what this session is about. How can we protect democracy from the darker side of digital progress. Now let me start with the good news first. The digital age can obviously enhance democracy. Democracy can, be more, can become more transparent. It, it, uh, it can become more participatory, more vibrant, more efficient. More people can, can participate, so we should not be and we must not be gloomy about it. But there's the bad news. The digital age has increased, has significantly increased the number of challenges for the security of our democratic societies, both from the inside and from the outside. It has never in the history of mankind been so easy, or I should say in the history of democracy, it has never been so easy for certain actors to influence public opinion, to create confusion and mistrust through disinformation, through hacking, and through uh, similar operations. We saw it through the US presidential election, and I don't need to go into the details, you know that. Of the top 16 stories on Facebook during the US election campaign, of the top 16 stories with the most likes, the most shares, the most comments, Nine, in other words, a majority, were, were fake, were fake. Think about that. And then people make up their minds and form their opinions, their political opinions, maybe, maybe uh, uh, their voting decisions on that basis. And these campaigns are only part of the problem. Targeted leaks are now relatively well documented. The uh, U.S. intelligence community, as you all know, is certain that Russia interfered in the U.S. election, not least by hacking the accounts of the uh, Democratic National Committee. And I know that my friend Dmitry, sitting right here, who will be part of the panel, um, he and his company uh, were, the, were the first who found proof of these types of uh, processes. So I'm delighted Dimitri is here. We couldn't have a better discussion than him. So let me just uh, close this introduction by offering a few arguments on what the hell can we do? Uh, what are ways to make our societies more resilient? Well, first, we need to find ways, and this is not, this is easy to say, but hard to do. We need to find ways to make clear to those who interfere with the democratic process that there will be a price tag attached to that, that they will not get away with it. What might be, that's the question we need to grapple with, and a question to which we have not yet found a, a consensus answer, uh, what might be appropriate responses uh, to these types of activity? This is also one of the questions we are going to try to address um, during the upcoming Munich Security Conference in mid-February, and also 
at a specialized summit on cybersecurity, which we are organizing in May of this year in Tallinn in Estonia. And of course, we have an Estonian uh, panelist in the panel, which will take the floor in, a, in just a couple of minutes. Second, we need to uh, try to empower citizens to be able to identify more easily whether they're confronting fake news or not. Again, this is easy to say and harder to do. We need to increase digital expertise. And of course, strong, and that's the third point, strong democracies need a reliable and a strong and free press. The government in democracies cannot and must not even try to prescribe what is true and what is not. We cannot simply forbid fake news. That's the task, I think, for civil society as a whole. I think NGOs uh, will uh, get into the, this business more and more of helping people to identify and to track uh, the sources uh, and the posts of uh, people who are in the business of manipulating us. Again, I want to tell you how thrilled I am about our partnership, which I'm afraid to say is a partnership of old, with young, of uh, traditional foreign security and defense policies, with new approaches in the digital world. I'm also, and that's my last remark, I'm also really delighted and proud that this panel is a panel of, uh, you know, of three Munich young leaders. We created nine years ago a program of uh, junior leaders from around the world who, whom we invite to participate in our activities. And three of them are going to be among the panelists which are now taking the floor. So I, I'm sure this will be a very exciting debate. Have fun, enjoy, and uh, watch the uh, proceedings of the Munich Security Conference in mid-February. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Ishinga. Um, we're just about to go into the panel discussion. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Thomas Upchurch. I'm the director uh, at Wired Magazine. Um, and we're just about to go into our panel discussion. But before we do so, in order to understand the emerging threat landscape in cybersecurity, I'm really privileged to say we have one of the world's leading cybersecurity experts to give us a bit of an overview uh, of, of threats that face our democracies. Um, he's someone who's unveiled some of the biggest cybersecurity breaches in recent history. So please give a warm round of applause to Dmitry Alpelarevich, uh, the CTO and co-founder of CrowdStrike. Thank you very much, DLD. Thank you for having me. Uh, it is always a great privilege to follow Ambassador Ischinger, um, although there's also a great danger because he's so great at very succinctly articulating the issue, and he's done so yet again today. Um, I want to talk to you about a little bit more about the threat um, that we face from a range of different actors that we face in cyberspace and elaborate a little bit on the solutions that um, Ambassador Ischinger touched on in his remarks. I believe we're now in the third generation of cyber conflict. The first generation started in the early 1980s with um, really uh, the start of nation state cyber operations that we began witnessing primarily between two countries the United States and at the time the Soviet Union, uh, sometimes closely uh, assisted by their allied nations in that conflict. And that was exclusively a conflict of country upon country, primarily trying to steal each other's secrets, national security secrets, and um, not really touching on the private sector. The second phase began in the early 2000s with the proliferation of cyber threat actors out, uh, that started popping up everywhere both criminal groups as well as other nation states, um, such as um, China, Iran, and North Korea, that joined the ranks of Russia and the United States in this, um, in this uh, business, if you will. 
Um, the criminals, of course, were launching widespread operations that were primarily um, done with a financial motive in mind, um, targeting consumers, targeting businesses, and um, uh, uh, targeting consumers that were starting to do online e-commerce and presented a huge opportunity um, to generate um, revenue from illicit activities. The nation states, on the other hand, expanded their offensive cyber operations uh, from targeting not just other countries and stealing their secrets, but targeting private companies and individuals in order to steal uh, both national security secrets, but also economic secrets that could help them better compete with each other in the, in the marketplace. And now we're fully in the midst of the third generation of cyber conflict, whereby we have revisionists and um, rogue powers that have evolved their cyber doctrines to incorporate full range of disruptive and destructive cyber operations against both critical infrastructure and, of course, the influence operations that we have seen against um, the really the social fabric of our societies and, and our elections. Last year, for example, the United States and the British government uh, publicly attributed independently the destructive WannaCry attacks that have um, uh, taken down corporate and government networks all over Europe um, to the government of North Korea. Um, ironically, um, the North Koreans were able to leverage stolen cyber weapons um, that, that were believed to, be ta to have been taken from the NSA. The Russians have launched wave upon wave of destructive attacks against Ukrainian critical infrastructure since the start of the conflict in Crimea and eastern Ukraine in 2014, including a cyber takedown of the electric grid um, in Ukraine, uh, in southern Ukraine, um, and it was down for several hours. Famously, the United States and Israel have been publicly accused of being responsible for the Stuxnet attack on the Iranian nuclear enrichment facilities that was discovered in 2010. And of course, we have seen um, the attacks on Western democracies over the last several years through influence operations and leaks of stolen emails and documents. So what can be done before this problem gets even worse? Let me talk about solutions for two types of actors, the governments and public policymakers, as well as the private sector. The governments, as Ambassador Ischinger so articulately said, start, need to start to work to hold cyber threat actors to account. Unless we create deterrence in this field, it will only encourage more innovation and more boldness on the part of our enemies. The good news is that attribution, the identification of who is responsible, is largely a solved problem today. Capabilities of both governments and private sector entities have gotten very, very good at identifying who is responsible, who are the perpetra perpetrators, and doing so relatively quickly, as witnessed by the fact that virtually every major incident that we have seen in this domain over the last 30 years has been attributed, and many have been attributed very rapidly. Now, however, we need to move to the second phase of the, uh, the second part of the solution, which is how to punish the identified threat actors and making it clear to them that their behavior is not acceptable and will have consequences. Punishment should not be limited to cyber retaliation. In fact, cyber retaliation is rarely an effective and, and oftentimes the least productive response. Instead, all toolkits of national power, from law enforcement, diplomacy, economic sanctions, and military solutions, should be on the table to pressure rogue regimes into compliance with acceptable norms of cyber behavior. And on the private sector side, companies and individuals need to start evolving their security strategies to be commensurate with the threat that they face. We need to start to realize that we will not stop every attacker from being able to enter our networks. It is an impossibility. There will always be numerous vulnerabilities that can be exploited, and more importantly, there will always be users who will click and open up any document that gets sent to them, even those that they clearly should not do. Instead, our security model needs to change to that of speed and agility, for hunting for attackers on our networks, assuming that they're already there, discovering them, and quickly ejecting them before they can do any harm. Technologies like the cloud, artificial intelligence, and machine learning are going to be revolutionary to making this approach efficient and effective. So let us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's make sure that we take these important actions today before we find ourselves in the fourth generation of cyber conflict which history tells us is unlikely to make the world any safer. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion.
Thank you very much, Dimitri. I'd now like to welcome up our, our remaining panelists. If we could please uh, welcome to the stage Merle Megler, the director of the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, Safak Pavi, an expert on international migration, refugees, and a former member of the Grand National Assembly of Turkey, and Svet Svetlana Zalushak, the chairperson of the Subcommittee on Euro Atlantic Cooperation and Euro Integration, and a member of the Ukrainian Parliament. <laughs> so, Dimitri, thank you so much for giving us that overview of, of the threat landscape. I'd be very interested to hear from our fellow panellists whether uh, the emerging threats that you're uh, facing within different parts of the world are similar to the, to the, the landscape that Dimitri set out there. Uh, would you be able to perhaps name the top three kind of emerging threats from the cybersecurity perspective from each part of the world that you, you represent? <coughs> If you could perhaps start here with Svetlana, thank you. As a Ukrainian, I would probably answer first Russia, second Russia, third Russia. <laughs> but obviously there are others, and it's ISIS, and it's China, and it's North Korea. But the problem is that when it comes to these organizations or countries, we have kind of an overall consensus that they are the threats. But when it comes to Russia, I think it's much more controversial. And the real danger is that there are a lot of voices, including here, in Europe, well, what, which are saying that, hey, uh, maybe we don't have to demonize, let's cooperate, let's take away, san uh, let's take away sanctions. And this, what makes this threat is even more dangerous. That's, that's very interesting. So clearly that we have some, some recurring uh, uh, repeat offenders there. Uh, there's clearly some countries on the list which are um, uh, culpable more than others. Um, but perhaps... If, uh, if we do retaliate in that nature, do we, do we risk stoking a wider conflict and, and uh, escalating a situation? I don't think we have to retaliate, but it's a matter of existential uh, challenge. It's a matter of whether our democracies, whether our elections as a part of, I believe, critical infrastructure are ready to answer, to face those threats from Russian government, from Putin. And in my mind, look, in the uh, recent uh, past, we had Putin participating in US elections, in French elections, in German elections. Did we have a proper answer uh, to, those, uh, to those actions? Uh, no. And I think in the future, it will only increase this kind of threat. So we have to have a comprehensive international strategy of how we answer these threats. And Safak, um, obviously Turkey's had some tensions with Russia in the past as well. Do they feature on the top of Turkey's uh, risks uh, and, and, and uh, countries to be aware of in terms of a cybersecurity perspective? Um, that is not in the public debate at all. That's, that is not an issue in Turkey. But in Turkey, for an ordinary citizen, I mean, we are, of course, we are discussing here um, in, a, in a context of Western democracy. So, um, and I think we need to also discuss the perception of democracy. Um, after the end of Cold War, I mean, everyone here, maybe with the fall of Berlin Wall, everyone expected and hoped for a world uh, away from, you know, polarizations, uh, which didn't happen in that way. I mean, we thought Marx's legacy and as well as God's rekindlement with politics have ended, which didn't happen. Democracy has traveled the American ideal of democracy for all uh, concept has traveled into different countries in a different way. Um, and in the Middle East, I can speak more, much more generally in that sense, it has wore the, the clothes, religious clothes on it. So at the end of the day, when you look at it, Iran is a democracy, Yemen is a democracy, France is a democracy, um, Italy is a democracy, but the political systems of what we understand when we speak of these countries are of different nature. So, um, and I think it, there, what I see as a threat um, is, is the cultural differences. Um, and I think we take it for granted when we're talking about um, digital freedoms, that it is the language as a universe, we take it for granted and it is, oriented around European Western uh, values, uh, but it is not necessarily. So we need to look at which kind of democracy that these tools are being used in whose hands.
Absolutely, and I think in, a little bit later in our discussion, we'll try to explore um, the lessons we can learn when trying to um, stop um, certain kinds of malign actors, but without undermining the, the democratic values at the core of our society. And I think it'd be interesting to learn from the Turkey, uh, t Turkey's experience in that regard. Sure. Merle, um, from your perspective, the, the top threats from, from kind of the NATO's uh, perspective at the moment, does it match the same as Dimitri's? More or less, and I, I really agree with your three-generation uh, division. I think ultimately it's key to understand that cyber attacks know, know, recognize no geography. Therefore, I say first states, secondly state-affiliated uh, actors, and these are states and entities who do not really recognize the application of international law in cyberspace. And thirdly, I see the growingly the risk coming from machines attacking uh, machines. Yet the other side of that coin is that the machine learning and AI are also critical in uh, giving us in, in protection, in cyber protection, and they give us better insights into the IoT devices and help us to recognize the soft spots there. Dimitri, are we seeing much collaboration between malign actors in the cybersecurity space? So you always have the sharing of tools and techniques that, that occurs, uh, even through the nature of the fact that when an attack is launched, things that you glean about that attack can be used for both defensive purposes as well as offensive to help improve your own capabilities to launch uh, these types of intrusions in the future. Um, certain actors um, do collab collaborate more than others, and usually it's the actors that you would expect to have close uh, relationships in other areas. So for example, the Iranians and the North Koreans have long had uh, a productive relationship with regards to their ballista the Iranian ballistic program and sharing of technologies and um, uh, ideas there. So we have seen some collaboration in the cyber arena as well. It's not close uh, operational capabilities, but um, certainly exchanging of students, exchanging of uh, professionals that can help um, um, bring up the level of sophistication in the various countries. It's interesting in your introduction where you talked about we're at with the third stage of this type of cyber conflict. How far can it go? Um, if, if attacks on critical infrastructure is a feature of the third stage of cyber conflict, what else can we expect in the near future? Well, I hope we don't find out. You know, I, I, Albert Einstein famously said uh, once that uh, he didn't know what weapons would be fought uh, with in World War III, but he knew that World War IV would be fought with sticks and stones, and uh, we certainly don't want to keep going down this progression. Um, and um, the good news is um, there is a lot of optimism to be had because these attacks are being identified. The perpetrators can no longer hide uh, behind sort of the veil of anonymity. Um, the challenge we have now is how do we actually uh, create effective deterrence? How do we make it very, very clear to them that there will be consequences to their actions? And um, that is something that we still need to work on. Uh, you know, the great example is the WannaCry episode. The US government literally last month came out publicly and named North Korea as a perpetrator of an attack that has cost millions of dollars and, and uh, probably tens of millions of dollars here in Europe. But then there was the hanging question of what now? What's the follow-up, right? You have a foreign government that has taken down numerous um, uh, critical infrastructure um, organizations like the NHS in the UK, for example, like um, uh, shipping companies and uh, financial companies, and yet there was absolutely no uh, uh, repercussions as a result of their action, which only encouraged them to do it um, again and to do it uh, perhaps with greater ferocity. We will get a little bit more into the, the, the nature of a retaliation or, or counter uh, later in the discussion. But just quickly, uh, you've also been working with the Belfair Center at Harvard, um, exploring how um, democratic institutions can be protected in the cybersecurity space. We have a lot of business leaders uh, here at this event. Are you able to dis distill a few key principles that, that you found from that research? Yeah, so the uh, Harvard Kennedy School, the Belfer Center there, um, uh, has uh, organized this effort after the election um, uh, called Defend Digital Democracy, um, bringing together the campaign um, uh, managers from Hillary Clinton's campaign um, and Mitt Romney's campaign on the Republican side to try to provide practical advice to campaigns, first in the US and now we're expanding this internationally as well, uh, practical advice on what to do. 
um, that is focused on very simple things that you can do to make it much harder for attackers to perpetrate what they were able to do in the US election. Um, things like two-factor authentication, things like strong passwords, um, digital hygiene, and, and those sorts of issues. But also start to think about resiliency because you cannot plan uh, for um, the uh, case that you will stop every single attack. And, and particularly in campaigns, certainly in the US, it is extremely difficult because of the dynamic and fluid nature of these campaigns where you have people coming in and coming out of the campaign using personal devices, oftentimes relying on their families for various things, volunteers, uh, very, very chaotic environment, much more chaotic than any business. And um, if you assume that a determined adversary will be able to hack in, will be able to steal information and try to use it for the purposes of influencing the election, what can you do preemptively to try to discourage that? And um, when we look at the French election, for example, last year, and what the Macron campaign was able to do, knowing in advance that certain information may come out and try to do disinformation campaigns, to try to do other things, um, a lot of lessons can be learned from those types of things um, that can prepare, prepare you for the eventuality that you may get hacked. So quickly on, on that spot there, so it's the greatest impact from, from informa uh, misinformation campaigns, the surprise that's created afterwards. And, uh, and how exactly do you try and mitigate that kind of surprise? Well, uh, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, in, in one way, uh, the response can be um, also very political, right? So famously in campaigns, when things aren't going your way, what do you do? You want to change the story, right? And talk about something else. And um, that's uh, something that I think uh, uh, the Hillary campaign realized way too late, that they kept talking about the hacks and, and everything that was going on and not talking about the real issues that the voters cared about. So um, obviously there's a political element to the response, but there's also an element of understanding what it is that you have what's in your data, what can be embarrassing, and uh, how to proactively and preemptively address that. Absolutely. These are very great, simple suggestions. I recommend everyone to go and read them. Um, but perhaps there are more things we should be doing as a part of a defense of democracies. Um, perhaps there are investments in old-fashioned social technologies like education systems uh, and public participation in the political process. And Safak, it would be great to hear from you whether, how, how important you think these aspects are to defending, against, uh, defending democratic institutions and the kinds of challenges you've, you've experienced in, in Turkey in trying to do that. Well, um, from the Turkey example, I mean, as I said, it is, it is important to look at, to be able to analyze um, individually for countries or regions in whose hands our, our digital power is. So in Turkey, things are a bit different than what we are discussing here. Um, instead of, you know, foreign propaganda or cyber attacks um, in, in that way, people, ordinary people with opposing views, without e even having political hats uh, or representation um, level of uh, status, let's say, um, are trying to protect themselves from being profiled by the state itself. So if you are in an authoritarian um, setting, uh, then this kind of uh, information uh, that is available to the state about its citizens can be very, very dangerous for the, for the safety, security, um, and therefore it, it would I, I couldn't think of a way to convince a basic... I'll give you one example from the um, last referendum uh, campaign periods, where intimidation, propaganda attacks, as well as shutdown of all freedom of expression space for opposition views was, was completely not available for anyone. And uh, there was this... There are millions of these examples, but one worker, uh, factory worker, uh, who was 19-year-old, uh, he posted something during the um, campaign towards a referendum with some views, very peaceful views, nothing of uh, that affiliated him to an, any um, you know, political party or something. On his Facebook account, he said some basic words saying that I wish there was a no campaigner that came to this town. He was arrested before our eyes. Um, he was profiled, he was arrested within um, a matter of a couple of hours. He was kept uh, in prison just for having post, you know, posted something very, very simple on his Facebook account. So, we do, so how can I 
convinced, and he stayed in detention center for 29 days. Um, it went into his, his profile. He will never be able to find work any longer. So how do you convince this single person to get politically participating again. So who protects that ordinary citizen from the, from the machinery of propaganda and profiling and surveillance of the state if it is in the wrong hands? Absolutely. Um, so we need to also think of, of this rather than, you know, only... This is a different perspective. So in your opinion, the balance has been completely lost in Turkey? The balance is lost. I'm not, only, I'm not the only one saying this. I mean, when you look at Human Rights Watch, you will see that, I mean, right now there's a blanket ban on Wikipedia, for instance. Um, or 45% of global requests made to uh, Twitter uh, to share content on, or, and identities of people are coming from Turkish administration. 45% of global requests. Um, Freedom House has moved from the status of Turkey from being partly free to not free if in a so demo, it depends the culture of democracy in that country not only the administration um, if if freedom of expression is banned in a country uh, which is the fourth power in separation of powers if separation powers of powers do not exist any longer and instead of freedom of expression, defamation is free uh, and propaganda is free in the hands of uh, the rulers, then, then I think we need to look at solutions vice versa, uh, how to protect individuals uh, and therefore make a safety net because um, they end up very lonely um, in, in their political participation uh, willingness, let's say. And of course, overall, I think investing in education but not only making education available, but also the content of it. To transform societies into information societies is extremely crucial for them to actually to be strengthened to differentiate between fake news, propaganda, and, um, and, and uh, true information. So clearly it's a big risk as well for Western, Western democracies. Um, by, by focusing so much investment in certain kinds of technologies, there is a big risk that we could also slip down this author authoritarian path if we're not careful. Svetlana, do you have any kind of recommendations or tips that might pr protect our Western democracies from kind of going down a similar authoritarian path and, and losing that balance? Well, um, you know, last year, I think the title of the Munich Security Conference report, it was post-truth, post-West, post-order. The optimistic uh, news from that, that there is a still question mark in the end of this title, but uh, the realistic uh, reading of that, that it's, uh, it's a rhetoric question. And it seems that those authoritarian actors in the region, Turkey and Russians and from Syria and from China, they already make us uh, answering these uh, kind of questions. And in order to answer them, I think that if you look, for example, uh, after the interference in the US elections, so what happened next? Is there any court hearing that is actually considering the perpetrator? And is perpetrator facing anyhow the perspective of justice, of being punished. Of course, there is a Mueller investigation, but in my mind, it's more about the internal politics and it's more about of how this Russian interference was also connected to the uh, Trump family, uh, family right? And uh, we don't see a real international institutions that has a mandate, that has jurisdiction to investigate those interference into the uh, American or any other elections. There is not a single I would say, international convention or treaty or resolution that would make it a binding for all countries in the world actually to follow certain rules. So I don't think it's a matter of, you know, even Dmitry was uh, saying in his, in, um, in his first intervention that we have to come with 
sanctions and maybe a military also response has to be on the table for our consideration. But when it comes to sanctions and military response, it's also about a political decision. And very often here in Europe or there in US or in other democratic countries, we take it for granted. We are so much, uh, you know, reconciled with our peaceful existence <laughs> that we don't want to interfere with countries like Russia. So it was so difficult to get in even certain sanctions for annexation of Crimea or intervention, uh, military uh, in, 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 uh, intervention in um, occupation of our eastern part of Ukraine. So what I'm talking about, we have to have institution, institu we have to institutionalize our answer, if you want. We have to think about, about global uh, documents, about new part, maybe, of the international law, which at the moment doesn't exist. There is, of course, as the act of aggression, which is considered by, for example, International Court of Justice of UN. But at the moment, I don't think that cyber warfare and this kind of interference in our national decision-making or our national elections is part of the act of aggression. And I think it has to be. Otherwise, with these political decisions like sanctions and military things, we will never be able to face it properly. And Turkey example, look at what's going on in Turkey. Hundreds, dozens of thousands of people are put in jail. Dozen, dozens of thousands of people like professors and students and journalists and politicians are being persecuted. Uh, and, uh, you know, they are living through horrible repressions. Is there enough answer from EU, from the richest family of the nations in the world. Is there enough answer from US? No, because it's also a matter of balance of the power in the world. So before, unless we have this binding and, uh, you know, like a universal rules, uh, not political answer, not a political decision, until that moment, I think we will suffer from uh, these kind of threats. Absolutely. Uh, if we could have an early comment on that, because of course you're, you're working on uh, regional cooperative initiatives, and it'd be interesting to see and hear what works and what isn't working, and whether even an objective of a totally global universal set of rules would work in practice, whether that's a bit far-fetched. Yes, I wanted to comment on that, because I think there is a slippery slope in claiming that we need new international law. On the contrary, what we need is to underline that the current international law applies in cyberspace. And uh, entities like NATO or EU have done that. NATO claimed that as far as in 2014. Uh, what our centre uh, is doing is, is on, under our guidance, we've, we have published the most comprehensive uh, guide on how international law applies in cyberspace and how that does not just during the potential cyber warfare, but also during international conflicts. So this is Tallinn Manual 2.0 and Tallinn Manual, which is very useful, comprehensive analysis on how the current international law, how we can take that and how we can apply it in cyberspace. So we don't really need to come up with new laws, but we need to extend the current ones into the cyberspace. Perhaps the previous criticism of, of international uh, sanctions such as these, or international measures such as the, these, is that they lack teeth, that they, um, that they are, you know, the set of rules that people acknowledge, but they're, they're fr not frequently enforced. Well, I think these, uh, the, the talk about sanctions uh, relates back to the discussion on deterrence. And, uh, I, and, and what you said, Dmitry, that we are very close to attribution. Uh, that, that's very positive news. I think deterrence ultimately is about messaging. Deterrence in cyberspace is twofold. Once the goal is to protect a nation state, but on the other end, of course, we don't want to escalate conflicts further. So for that messaging to work, there needs to be four factors really. Attribution is one, and in that regard, it is very important to have that voice of yours stronger to say that we are cl coming closer to attribution. And attribution itself has two sides. There is the technical side where we are advancing and there is also the political side. And I think I, I would not so be so critical towards Europe. I hear voices as it was, the, uh, and from the West, as was the case with WannaCry or as was the case with, uh, for example, UK Prime Minister's uh, speech back in November, December, where she publicly uh, attributed attacks 
to specific countries. So first is attribution, second is having thresholds to, in order to have a successful deterrence. You have to have thresholds. Thirdly, you need to have uh, credibility. That means the will to retaliate. And finally, you need to have the capability. That means really the, the means to, um, to make the operation a success. I was struck by what you said in your introduction, Dimitri, that attribution has been largely solved. Um, is, that, is that the case? Is, 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 it very, is it now completely uh, easy to identify exactly where these attacks are coming from? Well, it's important to understand how attribution has actually been done. And there's a lot of confusion on this issue, and many people sort of think that unless you can trace back the connections to the original computer that did it, there's no way for you to attribute um, this attack. And of course, that's complete nonsense, because the analogy of that would be that we could never ca catch any bank robber unless the tracks of their getaway car lead them directly to the house. And of course, that's not how we catch bank robbers. The way we catch bank robbers is we arrive on the scene with police, we do forensic investigations, we dust for fingerprints, we look at cameras, we look at license plates. The first question we often ask is, or oh, always ask is, have we seen this type of robbery before? What do we know about the potential perpetrators? Exactly the same thing happens in cyberspace. When you arrive on a scene of a cyber intrusion, you collect forensic evidence, you try to map it to things you know have occurred before. And the reality is, particularly with nation state operations, they don't do one operation. They invest billions of dollars, train thousands of people to do operations every single day by the hundreds across thousands of victims over a course of decades, and you repeat yourself. You reuse ultimately the same infrastructure, the same tools, the same tradecraft over and over again, because otherwise you can't scale, and you don't get the return on your investment from the, the billions of dollars you potentially invest in this. And that makes attribution easier, because you, when you repeat yourself, you um, reveal the pattern about yourself. Frankly, you also reveal who you're targeting. So if you see all the victims clustered in one particular area of the world, you probably know that it's not a country on the other side that has no interest in that area that's doing the attacking. So a lot of those things are helping with attribution. And frankly, governments have tremendous capabilities um, to do um, intrusions in, in other government networks. Right? So one way to do attribution is to actually be inside the computer of the hacker and watch them do it, or tap their phones and hear them talk about their operations. And, and that can give you exact evidence on who exactly is doing it and why. And, and the, those, of course, are a lot of the capabilities of, of the intelligence agencies. So yes, attribution is largely a solved problem. Is every attack going to get attributed? No, but the ones of consequences will be. And, and one of the reasons that will happen is that attacks don't just materialize out of thin air. Um, particularly when the nation states are behind them, they're doing it for a particular reason, they're doing it with a particular purpose, and oftentimes by just asking qui bono, who benefits, can give you the initial idea of who's behind it. Excellent, because of course attribution would have to be solved if there were uh, much wider measures to retaliate, including conventional force, for example. It would have to be a very important part of that. But I think we've covered well the external threat landscape out there, and we're pretty confident on who's uh, at the top of that list. And, um, and so I think we've got a good idea there. But I think clearly there are also internal challenges, internal risks uh, within our own system that we have to address. Obviously, social media sites have been under a lot of criticism for um, being vectors and platforms for the distribution of, of propaganda and misinformation. Um, Dimitri, I'll come back to you. If you could redesign a social media site, if you could start from scratch, from day one, how would you redesign a social media site today? With everything that we know already about uh, how they've been used in certain ways. Well, that's a really hard question because, you know, of course, the whole purpose of these sites, uh, the advertised purpose, is to connect, connect billions of people together. Um, the unfortunate... Um, byproduct of that is that when you're connecting billions of people together, a few of those people are really, really bad people. And uh, you're uh, enabling them to be, uh, uh, you're enabling them to do damage um, in various uh, forms and fashion. Um, ultimately, it's a decision that our society has to make um, about what level of privacy versus anonymity we want to have. Um, whether we want to regulate free speech. I know in the United States, of course, we have the First Amendment, so we cannot regulate speech unless it is um, um, directly um, inciting violence. So um, that creates a lot of challenges. And ultimately, I think the best way um, to address this problem is to provide people with information, right? So as we talk about Twitter bots and trolls and um, other um, disinformation campaigns and social networking sites, um, instead of working actively to try to shut it down, 
Um, that's sort of the Chinese model. That's the Russian model. That's not the Western model. What we should do is provide information. I would love to see labeling of those accounts as a troll, as a bot, um, so that the people can make their own decisions on what they should listen to and, and, and hear. Uh, I'm conscious that this is a debate about democracy, and we haven't had any questions from the audience yet. So uh, does anyone have any questions? If you just raise your hand, we have a microphone in the room. No questions? Our democracy isn't working in here. OK, well, we'll continue with, uh, with looking at the social media platforms and the internal challenges that we face. So um, from our keynote speaker this morning, we had uh, uh, Scott Galloway, who wrote this uh, book of four, which I'm sure a lot of people have read here. And in, at the beginning of the concluding chapter, he, he has a quote which reads, in a democratic society, the existence of large centers of private power is dangerous to the continuing vitality of a free people. Is the, rise of a large, uh, is the rise of large monopolies a problem for our democracy? Svetlana, if, if you could take this, this tricky question. Monopolies. Well, um, you know, I think there are a number of monopolies in the world, natural, unnatural, I don't know, like on TV, in many, even democratic countries, uh, TV channels are monopolized by so-called oligarchs in our region or by very rich uh, people, billionaires in, I don't know, in US, in some other countries. Uh, also, when it comes to natural monopolies, like, for example, gas, right? It happens so that it's Saudi Arabia and Russia who has uh, gas and oil and so on. But the real problem is that if you look at, at monopolies, uh, the, the real problem is that the, the lack of the regulation uh, which regulates life of these monopolies and their influence on, 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 our, on our democracies. And here, where the problem is, I believe, and it's the same thing with, the, with social networks, because in a way they're also monopolies, right? And on the one hand, I believe they are already indispensable institutions of our uh, societies, of our politi political lives. They make our, obviously there are a lot of positive things, they make our communication more horizontal, they make our decision-making more inclusive, then make our democracy more participative, uh, and so on. But uh, if there, are, there is a lack of this regulation, we have uh, all kind of the problems that uh, makes us vulnerable or exposed to those people who abuse uh, the power of the cyber, you know, um, digital, digital instruments. Because as Dmitry has said in the beginning, and I agree with him, in, uh, in peaceful hands, these kind of instruments can help our uh, lives and our democracies. But in hands like uh, Mr. Putin, this is where we have uh, those problems. So I think uh, accountability and uh, positive regulation uh, is uh, uh, those instruments that can help us to protect us from these monopolies. You interestingly brought up regulation there, which I think is a, an interesting thing that a lot of uh, business leaders are facing at the moment. Certainly in Europe, GDPR is, is just around the corner in May. Uh, it has an interesting uh, provision within the kind of cybersecurity uh, perspective, which I believe that is quite a hefty uh, fine if, if there's any uh, evidence of misuse of um, people's data. Merle, would you be able to comment on how you think um, GDPR might be changing the, the kind of continental response to cybersecurity? Well, I think the fact that EU has issued GDPR along also with the Network Information Security Directive and the upgraded uh, cybersecurity package are all signs of EU taking more active role in, in thinking and raising the awareness of the people of Europe in the cybersecurity threats. The GDPR in, in concrete ways, I think, helps us to raise the awareness of the risks linked with the data privacy and ultimately um, helps people to realize that there is no such thing as a free app paraphrase uh, my former boss. So um, it's ultimately a positive thing. I think it works ways uh, towards uh, European countries building up their resilience, um, uh, which, which also is, is a side of, of becoming stronger, more resilient, uh, more aware of the cyber attacks. So I see it as a positive. It's a positive. And, and do you think it goes far enough in its, in its provisions? Uh, I think it's a 4% hit on total revenues if, if there's any evidence of uh, mishandling of data. Is, is, that, is that far enough? Are other P 
people have suggested that maybe even individual managers of companies should be um, uh, sanctioned or, or blamed if there's a problem. Is that going too far, or is that, is that kind of uh, enough for GDPR? Well, ultimately, I think I, I take a few steps back and, and look at uh, what is enough or, or how to best approach um, an ideal situation whereby you have um, a country that is uh, secure, uh, that has high rates in security, in cybersecurity, but at the same time wouldn't uh, pay price in internet freedom. Um, Estonia is, for example, one of them. The, uh, by the International Telecommunications Union, uh, it's, uh, it's first in Europe in cybersecurity, and by the Freedom, Freedom House, it uh, has the freest internet. So, question, how to achieve that. And the way of going is to have a whole of government, whole of society approach to it. I think the 2007 cyber attacks were uh, more than 10 years now ago, were a good wake up call to the society and the um, strategic decision makers. Uh, raising their awareness is key as well. And ultimately, you have to have a um, solid technical approach um, to have the organizational uh, tackle the organizational aspects, which ultimately is the government and business dialogue, and also um, educational. So you have to talk to people and be strategic communication, be transparent about the risks, and talk to people about the risks. And this is what takes us closer. So, Can I just make one comment absolutely. on GDPR? Because I think this is a really important um, point to make, and that is that privacy and security are not the same thing. Of course, security can assist privacy, but some of the things that I am seeing in Europe are extremely troubling in, in the fact that they actually weaken security. And one example of that is, is for example, the treatment of IP addresses that are, are being treated in many cases as personal identifiable information and something that is restricted from sharing. These things are actually fundamental to security. The, this is how you are able to determine who is attacking you. Um, uh, this is how you're able to block a lot of these attacks. So some of the regulations on privacy, I think, are going too far and are weakening security, which ultimately is going to weaken privacy. And that's something to think about as well. So it's an adverse effect. But do you actually mean in specific reference to GDPR there? Or? Uh, GDPR and other privacy regulations, absolutely. The privacy um, regulators need to be absolutely thinking about what is going to be the impact on cybersecurity. I understand the concerns about the aggregation of personal data. I understand the concerns about the use of that data for marketing. But to the extent that some of that data, and most of it is not even personally identifiable, but to the extent that it needs to be used to identify the bad actors, to identify um, attacks, that data needs to be protected and exempted uh, from some of these regulations because you have to share it because that's the only way that you can ultimately um, create uh, resilience in our system. We were talking a little bit earlier about government responses to, to cybersecurity measures and particularly into fake news. And, um, and in the UK today, the, the UK government announced that they would be setting up a, a rapid response fake news unit to deal with, with campaigns of misinformation. Um, one of the criticisms put forward is that governments aren't necessarily the most rapid at responding at uh, types of news like this. Um, what's your thought on this? Should the government or the private sector be leading on, on the response to misinformation campaigns? Well, um, the problem, of course, with propaganda and misinformation campaigns is the first thing that they'll try to discredit is your response in of itself. <laughs> and, um, of course, in the United States, we're seeing uh, attacks on... Uh, different media, whether it's the conservatives attacking liberal media, liberal media attacking conservative media, and it's creating an environment in which our enemies are thriving because um, the message that they're putting out there is no one can be trusted, and everything out there is fake, and then of course plays into the hands of Russia and others, and that's the fundamental problem that we face. So I'm not, you know, I think it's a good step. I'm not sure it's actually going to address the problem. Please, Valer. Well, I, th I think there is, there is good solutions being done in, in working together. Well, it's useful that the government is stepping up and doing something, but um, trusting solely the government is, is not enough, I think. And there are very useful uh, initiatives on the private sector as well. Facebook itself, for example, has outlined uh, three uh, tactics used by malicious actors using their platforms for, for misinformation and disinformation operations. And this works a good way into um, making the people understand more how these techniques work, how the disinformation techniques work. Well, these three are first, there is a targeted data collection, 
Then second, there is a content uh, creation, be it false or real. And thirdly, there is the false amplification through coordinated um, fake um, at, um, addresses. So I see that there, we shouldn't be debating about whether it's the government or, or the private sector. You need both and you need a sort of comprehensive approach to this. And I, and I guess the last component part of that are the individuals within a society and the actual um, kind of um, vitality of the democracy itself. Um, in the UK, up until recently, uh, we've really suffered with this problem. Uh, people have been uh, leaving ma major political parties and have been um, outside of the political process for some time. In fact, I read recently that there are more members of the Royal Ornithological Society than there are of all the major political parties combined, and that's the uh, Society for the Love of Birds. So, so that's how uh, that's a real problem in the UK. Um, but how do we encourage citizens uh, to re-engage with the political process, uh, to strengthen the democratic process? Safak, if you could please take that one. That trust, again, we are talking about which geography and which context. So uh, while this is happening in, in the UK, um, in other landscapes where there are authoritarian regimes are, um, people are trying to be on the side of the power in order to protect themselves individually from any kind of repercussions or, or profiling or whatever. So that is, that is also happening outside. But how do we encourage? First of all, um, I would like to come back to, to the field that I'm working on is the migration crisis. Um, people have seen that since 2003, with a claim to bring democracy in Iraq, as you know, the Pandora's box has been opened. And since then, um, it's like Russian matrushkas, it's been opening up. Um, and, and the consequences of military interventions or insisting on proxy wars to, with a claim to bring democracy has ended up with floods of people to Europe. And in the UK, this, this was not supported. These views that came from the political parties, let's say, or administrations in Europe was not necessarily supported, as you know very well as well, by the civil society or individuals of that society. But repercussions, consequences have been lived all together. So therefore, I think this was a breaking point between the societies and political parties um, that we have very recently also witnessed in 2015, migration crisis, refugee crisis. Um, and I think that was also a turning point between the trust of individuals, uh, European citizens, with their political parties and representations. Today, when I look at it from a European landscape, I do see that politics is not steering the society any longer, but social divisions are steering the uh, politics. And so far, there and migration crisis, refugee crisis, and disinformation, discrimination, polarization around it, that has been the center point of many political campaigns that we have witnessed in different European countries since two years, uh, has been the center point. So therefore, we have to look at the very root of the issue here uh, to regain the trust of people in their political affiliations. Um, and as you, we have seen with the French election, a movement that came out of a non-partisan way, mm. uh, belonging to no political party, has won the presidential elections. And I think this gives us quite a bit of f uh, clues uh, about how to, how to build, um, what to look at as the, as the issue is, and build, build trust again. In that regard, I think people as individuals not only should be held accountable, but also political parties, they have seen there are no repercussions for propaganda and misinformation to enter into a war. They have seen that was misinformation. So how to convince them again that this will not happen and reoccur? Absolutely. So <laughs> same with the Syrian crisis. Uh, there, unfortunately, we don't see any consequences and repercussions. And, and some kind of being held accountable for those governments that pushed for these uh, and uh, really um, and very openly and explicitly supported escalation of conflicts. So until people see um, that their political uh, representation is also held, there are some consequences also in that level. I think it will be a bit difficult to convince people to get politically involved again. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned briefly there uh, uh, Macron's uh, kind of rise in the French elections. And of course, he had 
um, coming back to the technology side of things, he, he had a useful um, app yeah. part of technology as a part of his political agenda. Um, I'd be really interested because we've, you know, we've gone into some of the hard issues here, but I'd be really interested to hear from all of you some of the more positive digital technologies that you are actually seeing help unleash democratic uh, values or, or have the potential to, to unleash uh, democratic values. And perhaps, Svetlana, if we can start with you. Yes, well, I came from Ukraine and I have to say that uh, digital platforms helped us to overthrow authoritarian regime in just uh, three, four, four years ago now, during our Euromaidan. And uh, it's my personal experience, you know, I was running at that point the biggest Facebook page, which was devoted to the revolution, and it helped to not just communicate and inform people, but also coordinate many efforts. For example, when you know that uh, approximately 100 peaceful Protestants have been just killed in the heart of our capital. So when we had wounded people, uh, so people sent the messages and activists just were going to the hospitals to give their blood or, you know, there were the whole social infrastructure which was absolutely impossible to make in any other way. And maybe here in Germany, we, you don't think about it, but it's uh, definitely a very strong democratic empowering uh, tool. Also, I'd like to say that in countries that suffer from censorship, from uh, TV channels or national media, when they are monopolized in the hands of those authoritarian uh, power uh, governments, it's definitely a platform, digital platforms serve as alternative source of the information. And this is how you get the message through. This is how you have a chance to actually have a voice. Uh, and this is what makes a difference, I think. And any other important technologies that you see on the horizon for, for unleashing democratic values? No? In theory, I just want to, if Mel would allow, I just thought with your opening, uh, side, you know, I, can, I come from Ukraine and digital platforms helped us to throw out, you know, overthrow an authoritarian regime. From the Turkish perspective, I would definitely say digital platforms right now gets us arrested. So, <laughs> Absolutely. that would be... <laughs> it's a double-edged sword and can yeah. be used in two yeah. ways. <laughs> Well, as a final note from my end, I think um, it's, it's important to keep in mind that uh, the innovation is not a an, an goal in itself, but ultimately the goal is to make our, the lives of people, corporations and governments easier. And yes, Estonia uses online taxes uh, or digital prescription, but these um, uh, are nice things not just to present in conferences, but ultimately to, uh, to make the lives of, of the people easier. And, and finally, there, rather than just underlining the technical advances, I'd like to quote the World Bank um, digital report uh, issued two years ago, which um, was looking into how countries were really uh, drawing the digital dividends. And it, it concluded that ultimately, uh, the best is uh, in countries where the technology goes hand in hand with analog services actually, analog services such as legislation, investment into um, business skills and, and education, that you need the two of them uh, go hand in hand. Only there, there and then can countries be successful. Tom, I just want to make one point, uh, which is not about technology, but it's something much more important. So I speak on the issues of cybersecurity all the time. And this is the first time that I've actually been on a panel with uh, the majority of women, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I think the only way that we can actually start resolving these issues is if we get more diverse um, voices out there, and particularly brilliant ladies like these, um, to help in, in these discussions. So thank mm -hmm. you for organizing. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Excellent note to finish on. If you could all please give this panel a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.